Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm really pleased to see you, especially pleased that some people have come quite a long way for this event, and um, I hope we'll be able to have more the same. So I'm, I'm also quite sad because the exhibition ends um, next week. I'm going to move because it's quite, can I stand here? Well, that's yeah. the one. It's quite hot there. It's kind of moving out there. <laughs> So my name's Meg and I'm one of the directors of Green and Control Town Limited and that is the company which is a company limited by guarantee which is a not-for-profit and we're going for charitable status and we're the company that manage the control tower and the control tower is owned by Green and Parish Council if you're still with me. Green and Parish Council bought the tower in 2014 after it had been derelict since the end of the Cold War since about 1992. Um, so it, we're very lucky too because it's one of the few remaining buildings from the old air base because most of them were knocked down because they were in a terrible state because they don't build military buildings to last really. <laughs> and uh, we got ourselves open, I must say this, thanks to grants from the Social Investment Business, Green and Trust, Green and Parish Council and the Heritage Lottery Fund. And now we're open as you can see as a cultural hub community cafe and museum and in terms of the museum we've got four themes that we like to interpret which I hope you'll agree are rather wonderful we've got the natural history or the landscape the social history the military history and the role of protest in society which is the main theme for today obviously and I think everything about that is fab really so without further ado I'll introduce the people here we have got Shall I say this bit about protests can take many yeah, forms? Yes, I'd yes. like to, because that's kind of... This I is the introduction. Yeah, yeah. Protests can take many forms. It's often encountered in public spaces and collective actions such as marches, rallies, graffiti, and of course, at the peace camps in Greenham. I'll open it again when yeah. the time goes down, because it's hot. Yes. So I might even start again. So yeah. pro protests can take many forms. You can, it's encountered in public spaces, collective actions like marches, rallies and graffiti, but of course at the peace camps in Greenham. Yet protests may also appear in other forms that are less immediate and interventionist, um, such as texts, lectures and works of art. This discussion considers the different perspect these different perspectives and what connections exist between making art and protesting. So what we're going to do, there'll be two sessions with a break in between when we can have some refreshments. We've got cold drinks, or I can make you a hot drink, and I've even got some cake if you're happy. Um, so from three to four, each panellist will present for 10 to 15 minutes. And am I the timekeeper there? I think so. Do yeah, I'll if, just if anybody's go overrunning or yeah, something, I'll make a noise. Like a and, then, uh, and then uh, we'll have a break at four o'clock. And then 4.15 to 5, that's when we'll have a sort of open discussion. So if you could try and save your questions, your burning questions for then. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. So for our panellists, we have here, I'm really pleased, we've got three <coughs> professional artists and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, can you believe? Dr. Rebecca Johnson there. Uh, she's the founding co-chair of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN and a 2017 Nobel Laureate, and she's a long-time feminist peace campaigner. And she lived at the peace camp for five years, from 82 to 87, and she's going to share stories and songs from that time. Uh, Gula Atesh um, makes art historical references. This is Gula here. I'm standing in front of her rudely because it's hot. <laughs> um, yes. And by acknowledging Orientalism, a genre created by and for you period male artists, it is often considered mere aesthetic indulgences of erotic desire rather than accurate or cognizant depictions of the Middle East. And At Atesh asks us to reconsider these tropes. Kirsty is an artist and curator living in London, and her work investigates the atom bomb. While referencing the scale, beauty, and abhorrent nature of these events, she delves into the periphery of the subject, the myths, characters and surrounding evidence. As a child, Kirsty regularly attended CND protests with her family. And this dichotomy of sentiment, of, um, sentiment, dread and awe, it drives her practice. And finally, last but not least as they say, we have Robert who makes art about the human condition, rites of pa passage and identity. In No Eden, he presents images that only, not only reflect upon gender roles highlighted by the history of the peace camps, but also the problematic language used by men of power who since antiquity associate violence and destruction with virility. 
I think we see some of that in the language we hear around here. So I'll hand over to Robert. To Re Rebecca. To okay. um, well, I'd like to first of all say thank you to all of you for coming out on such a beautiful sunny day. Um, and to thank Robert for organising this. And it's, it's wonderful just actually seeing your art out on the walls. So it's lovely to have this chance to see it. And to make, um, you know, for all the events that you're doing here and, you know, Anderson in particular. So as she said, I lived at Greenham from 82 to 87. In fact, I was one of the three women that occupied the air traffic control tower just after Christmas. And my bit of art then was to paint a banner saying peace on earth because it was two days after Christmas and the nuclear weapons had just come in and we hung it off the railing just above here of, of the of the actual kind of, of observation deck of the and then nobody came and arrested us <laughs> because they couldn't see they were busy you know with all their lights working on some fire trucks with their rifles for, uh, 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 you know over the back of their shoulders but this isn't a, you know, for reminiscing about that so much as thinking about how art played a role, you know, what the protests and art issues were. And I'm actually going to show you this one first, just because it, I, I put it up there. It's a, mon a photo montage by Peter Kennard. And in 2011, in fact, I... Um, uh, did something on the other side, the business park area, they had a kind of Greenham Arts uh, Centre. I don't know if they still have it, but they, they had a, um, a similar kind of event and they asked me to come mainly to, to do the, the songs of Greenham. Um, and Peter Kennard was one of the other speakers and he showed a whole set of his kind of images from the 80s, from the peace thing. And I bought his little book. This is just my photograph of, from the book, but this one to the left, is particularly of interest because over kind of two decades later it got repurposed as this which is there this logo here and it was when ICANN uh, was getting started uh, the people who started it in Australia as a project of, of a group of doctors, actually, <coughs> they just loved this Peter Kennard montage, and they decided that they wanted it for the logo, and um, and then added to it the name ICANN, which is International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And this was the organisation then that I got involved with very early on, and then kind of became the co-chair to establish it in Geneva, so that we could work with diplomats and governments to get um, uh, a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons. So when we think about art and protest, I mean, the first question is kind of what is art? Is that art? It was the iconic poster that brought 35,000 women to Greenham to embrace the base. That was the next one up. Is I'm sorry, I thought I had something else up there. Okay, yeah. So, um, is that art? Well, the, the photographer certainly considered it his art because he had an exhibition at the Imperial War Museum a few years ago with all these pictures. I didn't consider it art at all, and I'm in it. <laughs> That's me. But what I did kind of consider a mixture of art, protest and non-violence was that faced with big digger trucks and things wanting to extend the base in, this was 1982, to, I don't need, I hadn't been, been at Greenham for more than a couple of months, um, in order to make, uh, in order to prepare things for the nuclear weapons to arrive uh, later in 1983, we gathered and we with wool and ribbons, we wove, and what we actually wove was sort of waist high, and we wove all around the, 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 the area, and then we lay down underneath. And it was very interesting to see the police didn't quite know what to do with this, and we'd done this with closing gates as well. We'd woven wool, we'd woven ribbons, and you know, others in the United States 
women encircled the Pentagon and they wove around, you know, the whole Pentagon. They closed it with wool. And again, you know, the soldiers and the police, they didn't quite know what to do when faced with women with this very traditional, you know, thing that you make kind of, you know, your jumpers for your kids and, you know, but you also make art of. Well, that was actually what then happened to me as a result of, of making that creative protest there. And I also want to say, mention that this t-shirt, I particularly wore it because Bambi is actually famous as an artist. She's a graffiti artist. She's a, a bit like the <coughs> kind of feminist Banksy. Um, and so this was put on the t-shirt by the women who uh, do Million Women Rise every year. I think this one was from a couple of years ago, 2017. Um, which is a, 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 a gallery of women that, 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 that take over kind of central London one day a, a year, protesting about violence against women. So again, you know, you see how these images can be, be, can be kind of used. Um, so I'm just going to show you just a few sort of little pictures and have you think about whether you think these things are art or you think they're protest or where you think they are on the, on the spectrum. Uh, and this one is both because of the kind of theatre of Sarah, who was from Southampton, you know, when other women had stopped the convoy, who got onto the top of it and just the, she was 18 years old and just, she, the theatre of that, and theatres of course are, but others had also actually painted the peace symbol, the CMD symbol, onto, um, onto the truck. I don't know if that particular person got uh, charged with criminal damage, but th what, you know, the painting would be considered criminal damage and a criminal act, even though the vehicle actually is a vehicle that's part of the nuclear weapons convoy to carry the cruise missiles out to melt in the countryside. And she, I'm pretty sure on this occasion she didn't, they just tried to get her off there as quickly as they could and carry the, you know, get the, the missiles going. But she was, um, oh, she could have been charged with obstructing the highway or with, you know, dangerous something or other. So, um, I'm just going to sort of scroll through some of these. They, some of them I've given kind of a bit of, of you know, like this is theatre, this is right in the middle of, of the city of London, and it was a, a 1980, it was about cruise missiles, it was about all the money going into cruise missiles. Um, and, and this was me actually, I think I might even have been speaking and singing at Glastonbury in those days when people like me were actually invited to come to the big stage. Um, and maybe I should sing. Yeah. because I was actually asked if I would yeah. and there because that's my art I'm not much good I you know I, I don't know how to do painting and you know other kind of, 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 of forms of art but but singing was both a, 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 something I used in nonviolence to uh, but I also used it I knew it was creative and nonviolence has to be creative because you can't just you know, hit somebody over the head and move them out of the way with non-violence. You have to persuade them, and you have to change them. And you change them through their hearts more than you change them through their heads. So things like singing and things like you know pictures, those are creative means of protest because they change people from the heart uh, to everything. So and the song I'm going to sing is from. A, I'm going to start singing a couple of lines from a folk singer called Leon Rosselson that some of you might, might know, who made his career with, with protest art. He was Britain's Woody Guthrie, if that, or Bob Dylan, you know, if that means anything. Um, but, you know, absolutely lovely man, and his wife did Women in Black vigils and things like that with me in later years. And so he wrote a song um, called The World Turned Upside Down, or sometimes called The Digger's Song, and it starts in 1649 to St. George's Hill. A ragged band they call the diggers came to show the people's will. Well, I used to sing that song and I loved it, but I, when I was stuck in Holloway in about 85, with not very much to do, frankly, and I can't remember quite why, but I had a, 
a, a book and a pen, and that was about all. And I think I'd possibly been put in solitary, very probably for singing, because that did did happen to me. And I put some words to it that were our Digger's song, our Greenham song. In 1981, to Greenham Bays, a band of women with their children came to claim the women's space. They defied the governments, they defied the laws. They were the dispossessed, reclaiming what was theirs. We come in peace, they said, the truth to show. We come to stop your nuclear madness and to make the commons grow. This earth divided, we will make whole. So it shall be a common treasury for all. Your wealth and weapons we do disdain. We will not let you make our earth a wasteland with your nuclear games. We'll stop your arms trade, your thefts and lies. We'll feed the hungry, women of the world will rise. You've made your laws to chain us well. When we protest against your murders, then you lock us in a cell. We won't obey your mad commands. We won't be silent as you try to rape our lands. We work, we eat together, we laugh and love. We share the earth, her fruits and flowers, and the sun and rain above. We are free women, angry and strong. We are the misfits of a world where right is wrong. From the US military, the orders came. So Newbury Council sent its bullies, whom the future will condemn. They destroyed our benders, now they come each day. But bailiffs have no power when women want to stay. Ye poor take courage, ye rich take care. For life, the earth, and our survival, there is nothing we won't dare. The common spirit empowers us all. Ye Greenham women of the world, we shall prevail. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's the UN in the background, mm -hmm. and it was taken just in 2016 as the UN was actually debating a resolution to allow negotiations to start on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and I realise that I have forgotten to bring copies of that treaty. I was, going to, your bag in. No. I was going to put them in, and I realise I have forgotten to bring copies. Um, <coughs> I finished a piece of writing very late last night, so things were a bit, there's the legs working. This is a very tiny version that I carry everywhere. <coughs> but I have a bigger version I brought the last time of the treaty. This is a UN treaty that prohibits nuclear weapons. So we've prevailed to that extent, but just at the point at which um, uh, the INF treaty that came about in 1987 as a result that turned uh, the silos into somewhere where horses could, could um, um, could graze and films like Star Wars could turn it into the rebel camp for the for that. Our uh, INF is being trashed as Trump and Putin are trying to bring the next generation of nuclear weapons in. 
So our job is never done. And um, I think kind of, so I've kind of shown this and so one of the things that I'd like us to think about is how, what do we feel about things like graffiti? As, is this art protest? Is it, is it legitimate? Is it creative? Is it, you know, all those kinds of questions. What about cutting fences? I was telling the story on the way here. The first few times that Green and Women cut fences to go into the base, I didn't do that. I did, I, I did the silos action climbing over the fence with a bit of carpet and, and a ladder, but I couldn't cut the fence because here's the Good Friday action. They clearly cut the fence and gone in. Because at the very beginning, I felt that it would be damage to property and that, that I was committed to non-violence and that was about not harming. And I had to really think about it very deeply while other women were having great fun with the bolt cutters out. Mm -hmm. You know, we had songs about, who's are these bolt cutters? Where do they come from? Maybe your great, great grandmother had some. <laughs> <laughs> Grannies are cutting the fences, they say. There's a lot of holes in green and fences today. <laughs> that kind of song. And then I had a dream where I saw the cutting of the fence as being opening doors and windows into the common land, the common land that belonged to all of us. And once I had understood that, I could get bolt cutters and cut with the best of them. And, you know, but I couldn't do it while it felt like it was wrong. And that's also something about non-violence. So when is it art? When is it damage? These are some of the questions I want us to think about. And then the kind of theater also, that you, you know, the Peace Boat had Koreans, Japanese students, um, and then they joined us who'd been sitting in these interminable meetings. Um, and, you know, we had people inside missiles, and, you know, I'm, I'm there somewhere in the corner, yes, I'm holding the end of it. Okay. And it was a kind of form of theatre to do things like that. So I'm going to kind of leave on that note. I had wanted to sing the song Four Minutes to Midnight, and maybe if there's time later I will, because that was a song I think that for me was particularly, I used that in Trafalgar Square when there was 200,000 people. They were listening to speeches from people like Tony Benn, and I thought, I'm never going to get their attention. And we ha I had to do something other than talk. So I'll leave it there with just those sorts of as much questions about art and protest as images that show what can be on that spectrum of art and protest. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Where I come from, which actually is, makes more sense. Um, um, people often see my work, um, they always think these places are, are, are um, um, from Turkey or from Algeria or from somewhere, from kind of um, exotic places. But this is in London, <laughs> the London <laughs> Holland Park. So I am, um, Lord Leighton is one of the painters who loves the, the Middle East. So his house, I will show you it later, you will see is purely fusion of East and West. And within my work, I would often like to show that how the East and West could coexist together. And I am from Turkey, from close to Iran, where mainly um, Kurdish people live. And, and then we moved to Istanbul, like so many other people from Kurdish. Then we became immigrant. And then when we, when we spoke Turkish, then we didn't have good accent. We were again the other unwanted. So another place. And um, I didn't fully felt at all when I was in Istanbul. And I studied art and I gave up. Because I wanted to be who I am. Be me, Gülen, not you know, from, from Kurdish side or Armenian. It didn't matter where I, you know, where it's, what is my background. I want to be who I am. And that's why I came to, to London mm -hmm. to study art. And then I felt again the other, because I couldn't speak very good English, people often ask me where they come from. <laughs> it's the same. I'm going through because I have quite lots of images. And then I decided that through my, I, I'm actually trained as a, um, I'm trained as a um, 
painter, not photographer, but I find with painting I could not capture more. Um, I didn't want to pay, it should be canvas and me. I wanted to have uh, much more complexity where I'm not actually, um, where I'm actually not in control, but the process, it takes its own control. And then I start to work with um, the model, and I, I often chose um, the, the building that links to the post-colonial history. Mm -hmm. Again, within this architectural mm -hmm. setting, I would like to question, or I want to question, what it means within Western mm -hmm. uh, British way, or the kind of Western eye, and through which I also want to look at what it means, for example, what actually, what, what actually um, these, these buildings are, I mean, I say this building because there are lots of other buildings, actually built with uh, kind of the financial support come from the East. Mm -hmm. So I also want to bring that kind of this strong connection. Because, and sorry, going back, this is the, um, the Leighton House Museum. It's this beautiful building where I go in, it's very tranquil, and, mm -hmm. and I feel I'm actually at home. <laughs> Um, I was working there for six months. They have given me this amazing. I mean, they gave me. Um, they gave me um, place to stay. I mean, not to um, to sleep, but do my work for six months, and I made all my work there. Mm -hmm. And then I had a show there, which was in September 2010, which I enjoyed so much to push my <coughs> practice and where I start to. Um, employ the Western aesthetic, kind of mainly Dutch painterly aesthetic, into my work because I'm still, I'm still painter who would like to paint through my own own camera lens. So you can, I'm just going with that because I have the last works that I would like to talk about it more. And this is um, Great Fosters. So I don't know if you know that is in. Egon. It's a beautiful Tudor building that built by Henry VIII and then should have been expensive. Very expensive. But they gave me the, the permission to work there and had an exhibition. <coughs> but I still have um, four works there. It's still on show. So. And this is Royal Academy of Art. Again, I wanted to use my um, the figure against the books. For example, when we have books, we have to really open to find out actually what is inside the book. The knowledge actually is people often think once they learn they learn something, they will always know it, which is not true. Being from Eastern Turkey, we didn't have books. We didn't have a library. So we have to we, when we had the book, we have to give one to another person. So nobody owned the book. So the meaning of book was very, very Different, and I often find people talking about veil, for example, but they don't know what is what is veil <coughs> is. I mean, veil is the veil is not belong to one faith; it's belong to all these different faiths. Mm. So I find it is kind of shallow judgment of a garment. It makes people to shut down to get to know the other person, and that's why I quite like to use the books. Mm. And again, I am I'm actually um, being influenced by the, the, um, the Western painters as well in my work. And this is in Holland, again the Dutch influences in my work. Again, Dutch has very long story of the, the post-colonial history and they still they do not they do not fully um, admit that what I have done. Still there's a big big um, debate about it. And then go back to I um, chose some um, few works that it links to war. And I since 2014 I've been in lots of work with um, the Kurdish woman and women, um, the um, um, Turkmen's. They're they're mainly from North Syria who had to because of the war they had to come and to live in Turkey. And I asked them if they could tell me what happened to them when they have to leave their home until they reach to a safer place. I didn't ask why they left their home. 
and that's what they give it. You know, I have 18 touch works, touch works, and unfortunately, few of them are. And in this sense, it says, um, I'm, he says, I'm going to shout because there's nobody else is going to shout for me. And I find it so terrible about it. But I have so many of them. And then I had to stop for, um, for a year. I have got a lot of them, like 8, maybe 100 works. But because I find it very depressed, so I had to leave. So unfortunately, it's not easy to, to do such work. And when you read the text as well, you see what they their voice is not being heard and they're giving me all this and they think I will do something and I try it but it doesn't work. It's I mean it will work some point but it's not easy. And this is from um, Brazil and again when I went there and I had to do some work inside these amazing buildings and I, when I looked at how the wealth being divided by rich and poor I said I'm not going to work in this historic beautiful building. I'm going to make live performances outside where people can see my work and who doesn't go to the museum, they can reach. Because I don't want to serve to people who can access. So for me that's very interesting. And that's okay. Yeah. And I'm going quickly. This is all from Brazil. And then I have made sorry a bit gumble. And this one is from the um, the Salvation Army, where I made work on quilt, quilting, baby clothes, and they're mainly Kurdish children. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, some of them are real people who moved from Syria to came here. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going through, and we made a live, live um, performance across state. You can see we're sewing, and then you can see the work, the, you know. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I'm I can just go through. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is, so you can see from mm -hmm. Eton College. Mm -hmm. And then the last work is I have done two months ago with again poets from Syria, Sudan, Iran who had to <coughs> flee their home because of um, they were not able to be who they are by 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 which I mean that they could not actually speak for themselves. They were forced to shut down, and they, when they couldn't, then they had to leave to come to UK. And this is their, their poetry in my work. So what I've done is whole room is full of poetry, which talks about what happened to them again, leaving their home until they arrived to the, <coughs> um, the UK. And the text is in Dutch, English, Turkish, Arabic, and... So such a which is another language. So it again is this is um, I would like to touch uh, the um, um, issue is when these people when they when they are coming to another <coughs> country people often find why they are coming to live in our country but they, these people are have to leave their home because kind of indirectly they've been forced to leave. I don't know if it makes sense, yeah, but I, I just want to, I, I don't want to talk for, I mean, I don't want to, to speak for them, but I want to actually speak with them, mm -hmm. and that is the work about. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm an artist, and I live and work in London at the moment, and my background, as you can see, was being taken on many a CND protests with my mother and grandmother and sometimes father. Um, so this is probably, I'm not going to bore you too much with my childhood, but it's quite, it's kind of links in. It's probably looking at the artist, um, but anonymous, apparently. So this kind of, these images were always 
and these, um, well, when I was going on the marches, there was a sense of sort of camaraderie and often it would be cold and wet and your feet would be soggy, you'd be eating soggy sandwiches. But then, like you were saying, when people were singing on the coach there, that would seem to a child like we were, like I didn't know what it necessarily was for. But we were all there together to do something, and something that kind of seemed important, but I didn't know what at that age. Um, and this is a photo that was in an exhibition uh, three years ago, and it's one that my mother took at Greenham. And when I discovered all these photos, maybe a year before, I found a lot of them to be so beautiful, like this is probably my favourite one, but like the police horse against the CND um, sign that had been woven in with the police man in the background. <coughs> and so I, I sort of spoke to my mum about it and wanted to collaborate with her on an exhibition. Um, so I collected the, um, we worked out the photos that we thought would be good and then we glued them up onto vinyl so they could be really, because I couldn't afford these frames this big, so I wanted really massive photographs, so I decided photographic vinyl was a good way. Um, and that was the biggest one, it was probably about six feet wide. Wow. Wow. Um, and also from the photographs, I felt like I wanted to somehow kind of reach in and almost like make a little portal where I could bring things out. Where So I decided I wanted to recreate some of the, um, <coughs> some of the um, sort of artifacts or how do you say, um, some of the um, things that I could see in the backgrounds of the photographs. And this is a sort of a strange one, because I've um, seen the next photograph from this photo, it's a bit blurry. That's me at the front. <laughs> And um, yeah, so the balloon, the balloon is a, who's holding the balloon? Is the balloon speaking? You know, mm -hmm. it's asking. It's kind of like a suicidal balloon. It's kind of strange when you think it through too much, but um, but the sentiments there. <coughs> and then this is another piece that I made, which we created a sign that I could see in one of the photographs. Um, explaining. The exhibition was called Women Walked Onto the Base last Tuesday after this. And I just love the bit at the end as well. We also need donations for getting flower copies made. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of practice. <laughs> <laughs> And then when the exhibition was on, you were singing the tune to yeah, it earlier. I, I, was, that's um, the I sang the second verse to this. <laughs> yep. um, one of the Green and women came to the show and she was chatting to me and telling me some of her stories. And then she left me this note, which was kind of, um, well, she said, of course, you all probably know, but at the time the press were hailing the Green and women as witches. And then she said there was a point where it seemed like you just have to reclaim the words. And then this was a song maybe that did that. That's how she felt about it. So that, um, was kind of my background growing up and then when I was maybe 10 or 11 at school we had um, a day where one of the teachers was ill and so when that would happen we'd get to watch a film so they wheeled out the big telly and it's you know a moment of excitement our eyes are wide and then they showed us I went to school in Yorkshire and they showed us the film Threads oh, okay. which if any of you have seen is um, a yeah. film about in set in Sheffield and the um, <coughs> Soviet Union basically attacks Sheffield with I think more than one oh there's there's a there's a fair few um, atom bombs around. Um, and it's the story of this family and their day to day life very gruesomely turning into the nuclear winter and then it goes on for months and months. It drags out the process and it's not the happiest of endings. Um, so they showed us all that, and we were all basically horrified, and um, because it seemed so close to home, it could happen to us. We were spent <coughs> into a whirlwind of fear. So that kind of was the moment when I sort of realised what all my childhood mm. outings had been for to avoid Barry Hines' film threats. <laughs> and so into some more of my practice, 
um, I sort of became interested in um, images and stories and characters around the atom bomb and its development and how um, I guess I want to sort of make big works, <coughs> in this case a painting, which is sort of quite confrontational and maybe um, using painting because there's such a split second in time and yet when I'm making these things they take months, like that one probably took about three months to make. And so I'm kind of thinking this image through so much, every little speck of, um, you know, every little speck of dust and a bit of wood that's lying on. Um, whereas these things um, were happening at a rate of knots in the Nevada desert in the 50s and 60s, especially. Um, and so, yeah, I'll be able to next minute. So this is another piece of painting. It's not quite as big. Um, and I guess it shows how um, not all beautiful things are good, mm. which I kind of am mm. always thinking about, mm. and how um, questioning sort of how we can create, how this has been created when it's, a, it's against our own species, basically. It's, so, it's such um, a kind of greedy thing to have done and yet we're still continuing with all the greed and so I'm constantly thinking about all these different aspects in my mind and I guess painting is a good way to think things through for yourself because it, my way of painting is just layered on top of very thin layers and it sort of just takes so long so it's kind of like a meditation on the ideas <coughs> this is still from a short film that I made out of archive footage from the US military um, and I found this big batch of <coughs> footage that was about 12 hours long it was all silent but um, alongside some of the things that a lot of people have seen on YouTube and it's quite <coughs> recognizable there was a lot of um, a lot of outtakes so I found it quite fascinating how um, the cameramen in the aeroplanes would be scanning the skies because they, because this one also, this um, this um, nuclear test was dropped slightly in the wrong place, so they were scanning the skies to see where it was going to drop because they had to film it. Um, so there were a lot of outtakes because it was in the wrong place. So this film is kind of about the cameramen scanning around looking for this kind of protagonist who turns up briefly um, <coughs> and then this was a performance that I organised with a cellist who I just met, Hal, very good one, if anyone needs one, he's in Manchester <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, I asked him to watch the film because I didn't know, I kind of knew that I loved cello and maybe at the right tone for the film, but I didn't know. I have like a bit of a musical background, but I could never write a um, score or anything like that. So I asked him to go and watch it a few times, and then um, I commissioned him to play the piece on the evening of performance, and I had not, I'd not listened to what he'd done, so it was nice in a way to kind of um, give over control to someone else in a way, and work collaboratively um, instead of having so much control like you might do just working on your own work. Um, and it turned out really well, so it's recommended. Um, and this is one that I do impromptu often at exhibitions. Just a small cry for help. <laughs> yeah, on a whitewashed window, sorry. Which is um, which was in the sort of protect and survive leaflets and Whitewashing your window would help protect your house from the blast of a nuclear <laughs> explosion. <laughs> and it did work a tiny bit in the test. And this is a much smaller piece <coughs> in ceramic. And I'm always kind of fascinated by, well, fascinated is one word, but always captured by um, sandbags whenever I see them because they always look so. Um, 
like creatures crawling along, um, <laughs> like they're hugging, or you know, and they're here, they're sort of here in history, historically, to protect us and provide barriers against something that's um, going to cause us harm, like a flood or gunfire. <clears throat> um, so this was a sort of um, exploration into ceramics, which I enjoyed. I haven't got kilns though. That was an audio piece, but um, I can't really play it, can I? Because it was linked in there. We could maybe, we could maybe try and get it set up for the, oh, right, for the yeah. second half, I think, yeah. Um, so this it's a long piece now, it's 15 minutes long now, and it gets updated every time I show it. Um, and it started off, I wanted to somehow represent the fact that there have been so many nuclear tests, and maybe some people don't realise there's been over 2,000, all going sort of into our atmosphere, or maybe just beyond the atmosphere in a couple of cases. But, um, so this was an idea where I would get eight different musicians to play eight different instruments and then I'd plot out a timeline of when each um, nuclear test and nuclear explosion happened. And then um, each um, second lasts a month in history and then I would, and then, you know, each, so there'd be um, Soviet Union, France, uh, Britain, America, India, Pakistan, and North Korea, all represented by the different instruments. And then it was kind of sort of left a chance, it's kind of what came out. So it kind of sounds a bit like free jazz, if you get to hear a little bit later. And it lasts for so long and it goes so mad in places that it does, I would hope, sort of take you with it into thinking how can there have been this, so many. Um, so I'll just buzz through the last few. This is a big charcoal drawing that I did of a palm tree that is one of the palm trees in one of the famous photographs of the Baker nuclear test in Bikini, uh, on Bikini Island. Um, and it's basically, it's called Witness 2 because it's kind of subjected to these tests against its will. And I've drawn it in charcoal, so it's kind of providing a sort of cycle between the burnt wood and the um, text. Um, I don't think I've got time for the burnt wood. Just at the end, that's the latest one that I'm working on at the minute, nearly finished. And it's more of a, less of a, a grand, um, you know, show of power and more of one that went a little bit wrong in Nevada and it kind of, I guess it kind of represents what's happening a little bit in America at the moment. I hope power's maybe waning, waning, waning off. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, we'll find out in the next direction. Good. Right. Oh, I guess one just quick thing yeah, sure. is kind of what I guess I was interested in was how people feel about how we can sort of inject protest into our practices, even if our practices aren't wholly about that. And what I started trying to do is to make a poster about something that I care deeply about, um, maybe once a month. It could be the same thing over and over, or just so that cause we're so kind of qualified to make images as artists, or to make music that I don't think we do enough of it, and if we can maybe send more things out, there'd be a lot of better quality um, protest material out there, compared to some of the crappy shit memes that a lot of far right come up with. We can outdo them with design, at least, <laughs> not um, this, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's a very good question to end on, I think. Right, so, I'm coming at things, I personally feel that I'm, I'm, what I'm, what I've been to the table here with no Eden and so on in my own practice is I'm fairly new to, new to the gig of, of trying to work out what it is to be an artist and my position to a protest. I've been very interested in artists who 
have sorted that out for themselves, but I've possibly, until the last few years, maybe the last three or four, maybe five years, haven't really been able to work out what I felt was an authentic way of using what I seem to be gravitating to, which is painting and visual art. Finding my voice, and I, that, that certainly started to happen in recent years. So I kind of pulled together some of the things that were resonant for me as I was developing. I did my art education in the 80s, so I, I, I knew about the peace camps here, top left. Subsequently, um, Tiananmen, obviously, as well. Um, obviously, you're well aware of um, you know the issues with suffragettes, and also more lately, of course, you know, I just wanted to kick off with all this sort of long history of how people protest. But what is it to be an artist and use your art to protest? As Kirsty says, how can we have agency as artists and still make good art? To me, that's something I can't escape because I do draw a distinction, and I'm aware of the difference between protest art, activist art, and art that is made by protesters. They all serve very different functions. And we were talking to Carl here with Rebecca about um, some of the banners that were tied to the fence at Greenham. The whole point of them being there was that there was attrition, that they would become dirty, they would fall apart and so on. That became part of the testament. They functioned very differently to an artwork which also existed that uh, one of the Greenham women would come and put up on the fence, photograph and then take away because it was too valuable. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I don't have an issue with either of those approaches, but they're different. Mm -hmm. Anyway, a little bit more about me. So, um, this was a painting uh, I produced, um, a series of paintings that I produced in 2016. Um, it was my turn. I've been thinking not from a, any other point of view from other than anxiety about what was happening in Crimea, there's some awful things in the news. Mm. And I wanted to try and say something, it's quite, it came from a place of anger really, but I wanted to use cartoon imagery, something very crude and something just absurd almost, to try and, this idea came to me not from an intellectual position, more and more from here the fact that a fairly agrarian society could suddenly flip over as it did in the Spanish Civil War and people just start killing each other with different, different ideological ideas. So now you're trapped with my chariot was, was, was one particular work. Another one, Abel Man, this, this idea of this ideologue riding through on his crazy vehicle with his light of absolute certainty shining out before him over this sort of wilderness. Um, you know, uh, and then another couple of images, which again we had, you know, the rise of ISIS and the whole use of vehicles to, you know, um, drive into various people. So, hero and zealot tried, tried, to how successful they were, but they were my attempt to try and work with the anxiety and the, and the frustration and the anger and the horror of what was happening around me and try and put it into my own. So, um, a little personal aside, my, my wife is Cantonese, uh, grew up in Hong Kong and we go back every year and in 2014 um, this had quite a, well, a very profound effect on me I think Rebecca would be inter very interested to see some of the photographs and would probably love to see the whole lot I took because it doesn't have to look like green. <laughs> you know, loads and loads of, uh, of, of tents, and they, they literally, if you can imagine a city in London, they took over the whole part of Hong Kong Island and brought it to a halt. Fantastic. And we went and we gave our support, and we, we offered money, they didn't want money to students, and they, they set up long tents, they're very well organised, to do their studies. There. You know, absolutely incredible. And they had a very strong ethos of, of, of non-violence. But some of the imagery there, I just absolutely loved, again, playing with, um, I mean, the contemporary art, you can find many, many examples of this, especially influenced by the Japanese, but mm -hmm. using childhood imagery, but using it in a, in a particularly sinister and malevolent way. These are some of the barricades that they set up. Yeah. Uh, just fantastic. So the garden, <laughs> right in the centre of the financial district. Um, there, oh, look at that. Yeah, yeah, happily, happily, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, 
I've, I've fished out a few quotes that, again, that over the last few years, I've been trying to work that this out. I just can't, we'll come into a quote in a minute that, um, from Philip Custom, which will articulate my feeling. I could no longer just go and make my art and not try and somehow link it to what was going on in the world. So, yeah, there we are, Ai Weiwei, we all know about Ai Weiwei. Um, this was what he did in response, and it got him in jail, I think, is the main reason he got him to jail, uh, to do with the Sichuan earthquake, that basically the Chinese authorities didn't release any of the names um, on the wall there, you can't see it very well, he got the names of everybody who had died, and these, these rods here are all the straightened out steel rods from Sichuan, where, where they were all being crushed and taken out of the So. Very, very good. Anyway, it's rather depressing, you know, the whole idea that we seem to be cyclical in history, we don't seem to learn from history, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure when Goya painted this, he, he, he's just, um, some of you may well have seen the cycle of etchings, which are far <coughs> and even more shocking than, 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 than this large painting of the Third May. But, um, Nothing much changes, but you know, what happened with the Napoleonic troops, Goya actually witnessed its documentary painting, it's such an interesting painting. But um, obviously a great example of art of the highest order also functioning as a form of protest. Yeah. And of course the most famous of all, uh, <coughs> Picasso taking on the classical art, he's taking on Poussin here, he's taking on the grand the grand machines of French painting, and he's doing it in his own language, his own lexicon. But it's become such an important artwork of art now. And uh, some of you may know the story in the United Nations, there's a copy of this painting, I think it's possibly even a tapestry. And when they were deciding whether to bomb Iraq, they actually covered it. Because they didn't want people to be influenced when it came to making that decision. So there, there is a high art painting, you, you know, Picasso, the great 20th century master, painting in the high tradition, and yet that, that painting is functioning. It, a lot of people in, in Northern, in the Basque country, Guernica, they want it back. It's, it's, got, it's got so much meaning for people, not just artists. Favourite quote of mine by a painter who's had massive influence on me, Gustin. Um, yeah, he's, he's just basically saying he, he moved from painting beautiful sort of painterly abstracts. He said he just couldn't do it anymore. He couldn't go in and balance a red and a blue. Angry outside the studio, in the studio, drinking and green tea and just you know, making a nice composition. So, um, arguably, it's slightly out of focus. This painting is actually in the show just over here. Um, this was my attempt, to go, again, working in a, in a sort of clumsy, expressive way, to take various non painterly materials like bird seed and, and, and dirt and charcoal. And I painted over an old woodcut here, and this image emerged as a, it kind of took shape. And I wanted to make a bomb. This is for the soldier show. And there's a bit of an outline for that show, but it became quite. I put it in as a bit of a get something under radar in this, in this exhibition about, about it. And I was linking the child, you know, the sort of idea of a kid in a crib with his little legs with, with the bomb image. And so many people got it. I, a lot more people got it than I thought I'm going to get it. So um, there is that trope, that, that visual idea comes through in, in some of the work in this exhibition. Um, Again, more influences upon me. Here's another work, uh, like uh, Rebecca showed, another collage by the artist Pink Kennard, um, and it ties in so well with, with uh, you know, the kind of things Kirsten was saying as well about, about the atom bomb. And of course, never again, to me, that's a very ironic thing. I don't think anybody's listening, and if anything, we're going to witness again what atom, atomic bombs can do if Trump gets his way, or if Bolton gets his way, or if you know. <coughs> Uh, another great work, which I never actually saw in the flesh, I wish I had, but it had an effect on me, because it, 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 it uses, again, it, it references 
something artistically for me that for some reason it's quite important. It's the idea of frontality and the idea of devotional art using a sort of crucifix image. Um, I've linked it to a work behind here, funny enough, called Deity, where it's a cruise missile flying across a very, very dark sky. This slide doesn't really show it, but I've made that cruise missile reference, you know, a god, the London denomination of god. But it, uh, across all cultures, religions will use this, and you know, I feel cruise missiles are, are venerated. That's what I'm trying to get to. Know. I have been interested that I helped make that. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, we <laughs> painted. See more after this. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's a painting over here that we're, I'm, I'm going to put it up on screen as well in a minute. But going back to the unnameable, this I, I just thought I'd pull together some of the some of the images that I conflated. So I took the bomb <laughs> idea and alongside the visual, I don't want to call it joke, but the visual thing that I'm doing. Here, Try and draw people in with the cuteness of the toy, but the horror of the bomb is the contentious language that we are still getting from Trump, from Putin, from um, a, a, a nameless Indian politician I can't remember. But when when India got nuclear weapons, he said, uh, "Now nobody can call us eunuchs." You know? mm -hmm. That whole idea of equating mm -hmm. weaponry with virility and phallic mm -hmm. imagery and so on. So. Um, Another reason for the, 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 the toys here, especially the teddy bears, but also, also these, these strange toys, is that the greener woman here, in, in researching for this show, the fence for me became a very important part of my research, thinking about the fence, the cutting of the fence, as Rebecca mentioned, also the objects that got tied to it. Um, the greener women tied dolls, they tied um, little, little puppets and, and teddy bears and so on, as well as many other artifacts. And these are resonant for me, and they also, the fence and the objects on them are resonant, because to me that fence is an ideal interface between patriarchy on one side, militarism, and the feminist cause on the other, and pacifism. And more broadly, male and female. You know, the, 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 the camps were, for very good reasons, all female. And on the inside, the military predominantly with males, so you have that interface as well. To, to have male gendered toys in my imagery suggested to me the paradox. I wanted to work with that ambiguous thing. The kid really is a bargaining chip. The women would put the dolls on there to say, look, this is what we're fighting for. Think about the kids. But also, the narratives that we tell our children. I want people to think about that. That every generation those gender roles, what it is to be a little boy, you know, little boys traditionally, you know, they'll play with, play with guns and girls and play and be more domestic, you know, those kind of stereotypes are certain two classic examples. So, so what I tried to do there was pull into one painting, those kind of ambiguous, contentious, ironic uses of figuration. Um, 96 Bad Boys, language, uh, you may know Al Pacino in Scarface, he says, say hello to my little friend, you know, with his gun. That language, again, is what I've tried to reference, and obviously, you may have got it already, the, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, the little boy. Why is it 960 Hiroshima's? 96 cruise missiles were stationed here, and each one could be made 10 times more powerful. Now bear in mind that Little Boy vaporised between 70 and 80,000 people as it exploded. It's just ridiculous to be able to you know, that amount of firepower, even just one, mm -hmm. would be absolutely terrific. So I'm kind of wrapping up. I, it's a bit of a long quote, but I couldn't resist finishing with it. Um, that's kind of where I see art just can't be about decoration, it can't be about balancing a red or a blue, you know, I want to make the best art I can, but it's got to be coupled to, to the real world for me and, and the issues of the day. So, yeah, it's an instrument of war. Um, I think that's, I think I've finished with that. So I hope I didn't rush that, but does that take us to exactly <laughs> yes. ten past four? <laughs> What, what I was thinking was, 
it's just like quite emotional in a way. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, you can't put it into words. And I think when people look at it, and as you say, you use the expression, Robert, some people get it. And then it, then it sort of has an effect on an individual rather than actually... See, I don't even know what I'm trying to say here. Mm -hmm. Can I but, suggest, I, I came across another quote by Ai Weiwei yesterday. Yeah. He said, one small act, no matter how small, worth a thousand thoughts. Mm -hmm. I feel quite yeah. impotent, I feel quite, um, how on earth do I authentically do something about this? I feel quite helpless about all the crap that's going on. Uh, and yeah, I feel a lot of people yeah. do. No, that's, what, that's small what came to me. Yes, the small that, that came to me that it actually might get through to a lot of people a lot more than listening to what a politician keeps spilling mm -hmm. out, particularly yeah. when they're doing it over and over again. And, even people who are interested in politics are bored, are bored almost with what, what's going on. But just looking at a painting, and I've been in here, and I've heard people say things that aren't really particularly to do with what it's about, but they're to do with social issues and social situations, and they'll stand and they'll look and they'll be moved and they'll come out with something quite mm. random. You know, mm. like in particular, I wanted to tell you about one bloke who stood here, and he, and he suddenly said to me, I think I told you, Robert, he said, oh, do you know what? I'm really worried about the fact that the people who clean up in stations, they're nearly all black people. That's what he said. <laughs> and I went, oh. <laughs> but I think he was thinking about how society, you know, it's like it's all these white male things in charge. Mm. And they're like the and bottom. And that triggered, so that's obviously important to him. Yeah. He's fine then. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm interested in what you were saying about how you feel impotent, mm. and yet actually being sat here and listening to all of you, I think that that's hugely influential. Right. Everything that you've talked about, and I've been moved by the things you've all <coughs> said, and so I think it's really interesting how you harness that power that you've actually got. You perhaps don't yeah. recognise that you've got it through your work and your actions, how you actually... I guess, to, to, to clarify that, that sense of it, feeling independent, what I mean by that is, certainly for me, the art, when I'm making it, I don't feel like that, because I'm engaged yeah. with something yeah. that I love doing. But, I think, you know, you do question, you think, who's listening? Is it just only me already converted, <coughs> or am I just playing to an audience? Especially yeah. if I put my art in an art yeah. gallery, yeah. the majority of people who come in, if they walk over the threshold and don't immediately walk out again, they're probably going to read it and pat yeah. me, want to pat me on the back. Yeah. And that comes I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not affecting and change them. I'm, I'm not going to achieve anything. That's why I mean, you know, I, I may feel better. I may have connected with somebody. But it's connecting with people who aren't necessarily like what, you, like yeah, us, like... What, what I'm sensing more is an urge to try and convert the ones who are convertible, because let's face it, I think yeah. there's probably some who are never going to be yeah. converted. Yeah. Never say never. Well, one hopes, yeah, yeah. Peter, did you want to say something? I was just making a comment about art and um, Green and Common, because one of the first things that ever impressed me about the CND movement was by a cartoonist called Vicky, V I C K Y, and he. he he, he did cartoons on the papers and got this great big image of a, a bomb and, um, and the effect of the bomb uh, and, and that was a cartoon and it mm. said more to me than all the editorials did. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. very good. Well, that important. was like When the Wind Blows, Raymond yeah. Briggs' thing. Yeah. 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 And you mentioned threads mm. and actually I, we got to know um, Heinz, uh, sorry, the first name's gone out of my head. Barry, Hines. Barry, because his daughter Sally, at the age of about 16, kind of ran away from home and went to Greenham. But then her wow. dad used to come and kind of, you know, and you kept mentioning, you know, it took him a long time to die and kind of, you know, and that's exactly what he was doing with his film, was actually reminding people it's not the, you know, if you're under the blast, you die instantly, and it, you know, there used to be a phrase in the 80s saying, you know, the, the, the living would envy the dead. Mm -hmm. And he picked up on that, and he, he made that film out actually out of all of the instruction manuals and, you know, things for Sheffield Council in the event of a bomb. And it wasn't that, that there was just one bomb that landed on Sheffield, it was that there was a war. 
Yeah. And so once there's a war, it's going to land on your there's major There's not going to be that many people to come and save you. If there's not going to be anyone. Over. And it was the council mm. having to go down into the, yeah, the, yeah. the bunker. But of course, the bunkers weren't Collapse. actually yeah. keeping the radioactivity out, mm -hmm. although they were told that they would be. I forgot about the council, but yeah. God, it was yeah, and, there. you know, a couple of us <coughs> sort of dressed appropriately. Well, one, one of the women, Tess, lived very near in Inkpen and had two children, and she and I uh, volunteered to do the training for, um, for, being, for Reading Council, you know, Reading District Councils. It was, you know, their bunker was below a major um, um, car park thing. And I just remember that, you know, and we, we got taught how to use all this, you, you know, I wasn't really known then, it was very early on. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, we were taken on face value. How to use the landline, you know, the, the, all the, the, the phones and the different, the different versions of things for communication. And then Tess sort of said, but when she gets the, 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 the phone call, and obviously it's not a four minute warning in that situation, then it was the assumption. And she comes in, she, she, she'd have to drive in, uh, and where would she put her kids? And they just sort of looked at her and said, well, we can't have kids in here. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So she said, well, what do I, you know, I mean, obviously I have to have my kids. You know, and she said, "Well, I guess you could leave them in the car." <laughs> I <laughs> love that. I know it was just like it was left brain and right brain, and just <laughs> absolutely not connecting. And that's that thing with art. I think that I mean, I'm incredibly moved by all all three of you and the and the different sort of stories and the different ways in which you're kind of connecting. You know the, the the art with the issues of war and dispossession and you know and the house space you know the whole you know how you how you get across to people what you know what it's about. I think it's really powerful. Richard, you you. Well, I actually wanted to go back to what you were saying earlier, Robert. Where I mean, you and I both know open land, open space mm. in Reading very well. And have you been to the? Um, Reading International exhibition so on that. I'm due to go there tomorrow. Oh, okay. It's fascinating. The there are a number of uh, pieces there, maybe mainly video installations. But the most effective, and it is incredibly political, is that you actually take the place of an orator, mm. and you have an or it is set up so you have an audience in front of you, and they applaud you. Mm. Um, and you are on a rostrum, and you are projecting, and you are given these awful things to say. I need to see them. You, have you, you seen them. it? It is so effective, isn't yeah. it? Right. Because you find yourself, you, let's say, you are someone from the American Friends of Israel. Right. And making what I would consider, I, this is what I was saying, I had this speech to give. And I was in this position where I'm saying these things that I find abhorrent, <laughs> but the attraction of having an audience in front of you, mm -hmm. applauding you, Very and clever. you become aware, you are, you have the um, pedagogy skills, as it were, or you think you have, and it is one of the most political things. Mm -hmm. you, you say you have, uh, did you take part them. in it? Yeah, I've done four of them. And how did you find it? Very angry. Scary? Mm -hmm. Really? Frightening how you take on this and role. And being from Turkey on the top of the mountain. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. if any of you are from Reading or can get to the exhibition, Open Hand, Open Space, uh, Brock yeah. Barracks Studio in <coughs> Reading at the moment. Uh, it's a Reading International thing. And um, the rest of it is good. That piece, which is not conventional art in any way at all. Mm. But I enjoyed the talk. One of them was giving a talk to the schools, and again he was saying, "I want you to know that there are nuclear weapons in Birthville, just at Junction 12, and I hope it won't stop you sleeping." And it was good. It was all very factual. But he did sort of say that here's the side of a rocket, and the and um, the rocket technology came out of the Cold War. You know, because mm -hmm. the Cold War fueled a lot of development. Um, and he sort of showed this slide and said, look at this big boy, ooh. Um, <laughs> and I'm thinking, uh -huh. QED, yeah. yeah. It's not, it's a metal tube. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so there's, something very, there's something very deep 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think we need to change that use of language. Yes, and language absolutely. Language is just something that we feel uncomfortable about. Yeah. Because perhaps we didn't think about the flags, or perhaps, but, but actually to you that's deeply offensive and uncomfortable. Mm. And yeah, I could have said, excuse me, why is it a big boy? Why are you calling it that? But it's, it's sometimes hard to be in that situation. Well, and you, yeah, I, I never think about it. Yeah, about it. Yeah. We were talking about that on the way here, yeah, and you, you, can you, the yeah, four, well, four Carol line Cone, phrase. Ca yeah. Carol Cohn is, is um, uh, a researcher that uh, during the 80s, when we were doing all the stuff here, she, uh, as a, a, a kind of sociologist, connected with the American, she is an American, connected with the American military, and you know, sat in with them when they were doing various of the military tasks, like choosing the targets, mm -hmm. and also even spent some time with these soldiers down uh, the American, um, that they, they had the Minuteman um, silos, which were, you know, vertical, a bit different from the silos that we have um, here. And, um, and, and so she was, was doing all that, and something quite early on that she, she wrote, um, she was, you know, the celebrations when a city that they'd, um, that, you know, they, they look into all these Russian, you know, Soviet, because it wasn't just Russian, it was Ukrainian yeah, yeah, cities, yeah. and, you know, plot, you know, all the, you know, facilities there, both from the military facilities to the schools and the hospitals and all that. And they would vie with each other, they were encouraged to have a competition about, you know, how high could you get your cities up on the target list of the PSYOP, the, the, the mm -hmm. basically the, the, war, the American war plan of that time, we're talking about the 80s. And, the, you know, and this guy sort of absolutely, absolutely sort of celebrating because one of his cities, I can't remember which one, was, was elevated because of the information that he brought about what it, it did. And then he suddenly stopped, he said, what about, you know, what? We're celebrating putting a city in a much higher place to be targeted by American weapons. You know, we're talking about millions of people, millions of families, you know, being, being killed. And he said, it went completely silent. Mm -hmm. He said, and I just felt so embarrassed mm -hmm. because I felt like I was a woman, you know, I felt, felt like they'd think I was a woman. Mm -hmm. And it was yeah. that yeah. crazy. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there was and another it, was, it was like we're not supposed to connect yeah. our emotions, and that's exactly so, what Greenham set out to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so Greenham set out, mm. in fact, directly. I mean, I had a, you know, I, you know, I was trained in physics, but I didn't use that when I was at Greenham because I used my singing. You know, I used yeah. talking. I did a lot of kind of talking around sort of different groups and things. We deliberately wanted to connect directly with the emotions because it was this separation of rationality. We got the, the rational arguments, but rational arguments don't change policy. Mm -hmm. And both uh, Reagan and, or rather Reagan's wife, and um, Gorbachev have both pay, you know, talked about the effect of um, nuclear winter studies. So it was that visceral thing that also came out, and, you know, was explored in the threads and in, in, in some of the cartoons and things like that. And Gorbachev, at least, I think, has explicitly played, paid tribute to the Green Common Women and the U European Peace Movement uh, for kind of raising the consciousness. But it's, it's this, and this again is where kind of, we didn't think we were doing art when we invited women to come to Greenham and put the things that you love onto the, onto the fence. And we said, and if, if it's necessary for you, you can also put the things that you fear. So there were a mixture of the kind of Hiroshima images, but mostly it was, you know, all these sort of, you know, children's clothes and pictures and really, and teddy bears and really personal kind of things. And it was all the way around this nine mile. I mean, I don't know if any of you were, you know, here at that time and remembered it. It was absolutely, yeah, it was absolutely extraordinary how women just came and brought that. And it was that emotion. In the days before mobile phones and emails yeah, and yeah, everything, yeah, right. how we did it, I I, I actually know. found the original, I, 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 I hand wrote, as we had the meeting in the crash caravan, the, the, you know, as the ideas were pouring out. And then we did it all wrong. Didn't, I, I actually found that in, 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 in a bunch of, 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 of stuff. Uh, the, the original draft, that then I typed out on my sit, sit up and, 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 and beg typewriter. <laughs> and then it was three pages of it because we had to explain why we wanted 
all of these, and down in this new brief, hum, you know, I managed, I had enough money to do a hundred of them and set and, and post them out. So it's three pages. You know, nowadays, you know, if you can't fit it on a, you know, something, three pages. Set it out, and at the bo bottom of or I think it was the bottom. It said, said, you know, please, can you copy and send out to, to ten women that you know? That's how we did it. So you just had a list of addresses. I I only had a I sent it out to a hundred yeah. like were of of you know women who were already a bit connected in with the networks. Mm. I think probably at least a third of them were in Wales at that time. But I can remember Manchester, and Newcastle, and you know yeah. Edinburgh. And, you know I I only had a hundred, and it was people already connected in a bit with CND, but women. Um and uh, and they. Uh, but they cop they did they copied it and sent it out. And I bet most of them did more than ten mm -hmm. to their friends, you know. And it was just extraordinary. Talking about um, use of language, you know, <coughs> offensive <coughs> language. You mentioned four lines earlier, the little rhyme that we were talking about movies, American movies. The rhyme. Uh, oh God, can you, yes. Can you repeat that? The Carol Carol Cohen put yeah. in one, one of her books. <coughs> it's. Um, I think it's probably necessary to stand up for this one because because and I think it's in an American movie exactly as this do, but you know it's um, this is my rifle, this is my gun, this is for killing, and this is for fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And American, you know, and with that training, kind of, you know, the amazing thing is that quite a lot of them were actually really decent people, and yeah. you know they weren't allowed to talk to us. Uh, but you know, sometimes they did, and uh, you know, and, and like the school teacher, who who taught the kids in the base, uh, just before Christmas, came out and she said, "I've just resigned." She said, "And now I can come and sit with you at the fire," and, and you know, and that, and that sort of thing. And we forget that round for two or three of the years, actually probably more. It wasn't just the fence, it was like four, five levels of fence. When we took over the air traffic control tower, I had to cut, we had to cut through, I should say. <laughs> Not supposed to admit to who did what. <laughs> we had to cut through, um, I think it was four of the layers of fence, and there was another very tough fence uh, around the, the, the actual nuclear weapon silos. But at the outer one, it looked like a concentration. It looked like a, a Nazi concentration camp, because they had up on the high stilts the guard boxes every hundred meters or so, or a couple hundred meters or so. We had to kind of where there was a slight bend in the in the in the, in the fence in between two of them <coughs> was where we chose to come in when we were doing this action. And the squaddies, the British squaddies, and they had been basically told their job was to stop the Americans shooting us when we came in. That was their job, because the Americans had been given permission by the British government, by Michael Heseltine, that if we got too close to the weapons, they were to shoot. You know, nothing was more important than, than, than protecting the weapons. And so the, the British um, squaddies who did alternate turns of duty in Ireland, in, in, in Northern Ireland, and here, they went back and forth between these two very kind of different situations. Um, they they were basically they believed that they were there actually keeping us safe, mm -hmm. uh, and I believe in that fact in many ways they were. Mm -hmm. And they're not. There was also the Ministry of Defence police, and then there were all the Americans, and the Americans controlled all their own activities. You know that that was not. You know, so it was these layers, and they had to be up in those. And, and a lot of people commented, and a lot of photos got taken. By the way, I'd love to get the photos your mum. Yeah, I keep being asked, particularly after the Nobel Peace Prize, I keep being asked to give talks and things. Of course, we didn't take photos, because we were doing it. And, and, and anyway, people didn't in those days, because it cost a lot to get them, yeah. them processed. And it wasn't like a digital thing. And we're convinced that loads of people have... I mean, your, your mum's photo of the horse with... Yeah. It was brilliant, and of course that was one of those... <coughs> either the 82 or the 83 we did an encircled base uh, both of those very similar I think they only well I, I, I think because of the horse it might be the 83 but <clears throat> we need to somehow you know bring together I mean it'll have to be libraries of different images 
but there's so much out there in you know in in people's attics and things like that. There is that project, isn't there, at LSC that we went yes. to the talk, the to yeah. archive, mm. everything. So yeah, it'd be great. And, and Reading, the, uh, Lynette's, uh, some of you know Lynette from Newbury. Her archive that she kept in her house for ages, it was always owned to people. She's given it now to a Berkshire or some kind of a Berkshire. Yeah, but some to Berkshire Records. Yeah. And some to the West Berks Museum. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But, but anyway, I'd quite like to have more photos because I'm getting a bit tired of the only ones that I've been given. Of that one where the um, photographer kind of took the credit, that's quite an interesting one because you'd, what you didn't think was our. Or did he think he was taking, like documenting, it was documentary photography? So is he thinking that that isn't an artwork because really it would have been credited? Well, he was one of the good ones, Ed Barber. Yeah. He, um, in fact, one reason why I have quite a few of his, his photos is when he heard that I was going around talking, he was there from, a, you know, he documented my first ever arrest. Well, that was the second arrest, mm -hmm. which uh, the, the first one was the century box. He was there when nobody was really paying much attention, but he lived not very far away. And then he brought a bunch of black and white photos blown up to a reasonably good size so I could show them. Because we didn't have PowerPoint. So when I'd go and speak, I'd, I'd, I'd talk about these. But, you know, the visual tells so much more than the words can, mm -hmm. can oh, tell. Yeah. So I would just pass all of these around and hope that I'd get them all back and nearly yeah. as I did. Mm -hmm. So Ed basically said you can use any of these whenever you want. If you if they get printed, if somebody wants to print them, then give me the photo credit. Mm -hmm. But I don't need to have the money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he you know, and he stuck by that. And then he did this exhibition at the Imperial War Museum and I got to see him again. And it was actually just before he died because mm -hmm. he had, had cancer. And it was lovely, it was really lovely to see him again. Mm -hmm. And it, but how interesting that it, you know, the Imperial War Museum and, and the mm -hmm. connections of that. But it was very powerful to see that. Now the good one, the good photographers kind of took that sort of attitude and I've you know, that's been possible for us to have some of those photos and access to it. But quite a lot of professional photographers, they took a load of photographs. A, we haven't seen it by and large, <coughs> or if we see it somewhere, we say, oh, that's me. Can, you know, can I have a copy? It's like, well, how much are you willing to pay? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, that's, and that's when it's not good. Because I think the photographer did take, you know, there is an intellectual property right there. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, photographers have to have an eye and they have to make a living. Yeah. So I wasn't, I didn't have a problem with him having credit for it at all. Yeah. But I realised that, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm personally the subject of quite a lot of photos mm -hmm. that have been used in all sorts of places. And I kind of, A, I have no control over where they used it all. I'm usually not named. Yeah. Invariably not named. And I'm a little bit more now because I'm kind of getting to be better known and they're sort of saying, oh, I think that's, that's that woman. <laughs> 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 but um, I think it's a mixture of them, isn't it? And it's, it's, it's again, it's what's in the heart. And so the photographers that share and use what they're doing, they have a right to it. They have a right to their names being connected with it, and we benefit from the sharing of yeah. it. I would love to see this kind of thing happen in schools. I mean, a three to five on an afternoon is probably not a good time to get the school kids, but there's a lot of kids studying art who haven't maybe. I would love to kind of have a thing, you know, always a roadshow that would go around schools. I mean, obviously take quite a lot, but be this kind of conversation that isn't just about the politics and isn't just about the art, but is about the, the interface. Because there would be funding for that sort of initiative, that community They're doing this with Extinction Rebellion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if any of you have got involved <coughs> at all, but I was there for four of the days in London. I was doing a different role. I was the legal observer, keeping, you know, making sure that everybody was safe until the police, well, and as the police moved in for arrests and things. But the art, the real, the amazing creativity, some of it much, much more, con in fact, I'd say probably most of it, much more consciously creative art than we had at Greenham. I, well, we were not conscious that what we were doing was art. But the yeah. same was true of the uh, EU march back in, when, it, when was it the big? Yeah, uh, October. No, more recently. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. astonished at the creativity. Yeah, there were so many. The wit, 
But yes, here it was. It was just glorious. Yeah, and now we have massive ones like that. There's a load of printed ones. And there was hardly any printed ones. Yeah, they were very homemade. Yeah. Massive. Are there any more? I'm wondering if anybody that maybe hasn't had a chance to ask or anybody has anything else to say? Because the cleaners will come and hoover us. No, they won't. Sorry, we have to have a Well, yeah. Anybody just poke one thing? Poke one thing. That is that. Today, maybe with the Extinction Rebellion, is that now the Green and Common? Or no, it's United the Extinction Green. Rebellion, but there's quite a lot of Green and Women. But I remember. Do you mean in terms of importance of prominence? Yeah. Yes, really. Yeah, but, but it is of, yes, it, I, I mean, I felt so, so much at home, but, you know, more so than with Occupy, which you know, although I did go and give some support. Extinction Rebellion has very much the spirit of Greenham. Mm -hmm. It's the spirit of a bunch of people coming together and taking personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the thing I also absolutely loved was the next generation of young men and young women mm -hmm. are very different. We had to be Greenham women simply to get our voices heard, simply to be able to explore our own creativity. Because in the 80s, the men that controlled you know, the peace movement as well as all the, the, the poly, just would have laughed at, they would have laughed at a lot of, well they did laugh, they were la they laughed and they were contentious, some of them, at most of the stuff we did at Greenham. But here, Extinction Rebellion is mobilizing all of that, and the, also uh, just watching the, the way they were looking after each other in the blockades, I was very aware of that because that was my role was to be the watcher. And, 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 do you, you know, think now that each individual person has got more power with climate change, with what we can do with social no. media? No, uh, I don't the think they feel... individual things that we can do, mm. uh, whereas what could I have done uh, apart from joining Green and Comet? You know, I just made fruitcake. Yeah, but so I don't think I did. they felt... I don't think they feel they have power because they've been talking. One of the other big green kind of moments of the Extinction Rebellion as well is all the scientists have done all the technical, the, 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 the facts, the evidence, it all points to the climate emergency. But the political yeah. classes, the, mm -hmm. the media, they keep trying to balance it off. And, and, and you know, so it took blocking the centre of London, but not just the centre of London, remember there were 80 cities involved that were, mm -hmm. there were, were, were people doing the same thing. And similarly, in a way, what Greta Thunberg did was the... The, the, a trigger for a lot of kids in school, a lot of her age cohort, the in the way that what that group of Welsh women did, even though they, most of them, with one or two exceptions, had, had, had left Greenham within about a week of the peace camp happening. They weren't setting up a peace camp. You know, Greta Thunberg wasn't, wasn't launching a, a rebellion, but she just did something she felt she had to do to draw attention. They just did something they felt they had to do and out of that came this something that was transformative and always went back to the, the, the individual. We are individually, personally, and politically responsible. That's the similarities. And then all the, just the upswelling of the creativity, the songs coming yeah. out of extension. And I think public campaigns <laughs> do have an impact because um, harping back to another sphere, really, which was my, my career before I retired, which was in medicine there were big public health campaigns for smoking and for putting a seatbelt on and pu the public really really changed mm. you know what I mean it took decades smoking isn't something everybody does now and everybody puts a seatbelt on without thinking mm. so, and the same thing's happening a bit with plastic you know nobody wants a plastic bag so I think if enough people are influenced I don't think it's, it's difficult not to be gloomy because there are such massive bombs there and only one could go wrong at any moment but on the other hand I think Everybody can be effective in a small way. That's a very positive note. But the other connection, <laughs> sorry, on the public thing is that I came to sort of see while I was at Greenland and then apply in the rest of my life is you need to get the public getting legislation change. Actually, the pe people yeah. again had known all the facts and stuff about about smoking, but it was actually when. It, smoking was banned in the yeah. workplaces, yeah. and suddenly then people had to change that. It was no longer 
just up, up to them. And I, the same with the plastic bags. Yeah, actually, it all has to go. Quite a few people yeah. have been complaining about plastic bags for a long time, but, you know, town by town until there was actual legislation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So it is the, those connectors. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We could go on yes. all night, but we'll try and do it again, definitely. Yes. Thank, massive thanks to the artist and Rebecca, who of course is an artist as well in her own right. Mm -hmm. We're all creative. Um, thank you so much for coming and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.